Welcome everybody. You are watching CNET's live coverage of the historic SpaceX and NASA Crew Dragon Demo 2 launch. We're here on a Saturday, originally scheduled for Wednesday, but as we all know, Wednesday's launch was scrubbed due to weather. So we are keeping our fingers firmly crossed that it's going to go ahead today and we're very very excited because this is a truly historic day guys we've got astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Behnken they're locked into their capsule ready to go now we are about oh less than 20 minutes away from the launch and keeping an eye on the weather as I say because it could get scrubbed right down to go time but things are looking good we've had positive reports all morning here to talk about the launch with me today I have the wonderful team from CNET I have CNET's resident space reporter Eric Matt, give us a wave, Eric. Hey, Claire. Hey, and we've also got our producer uh, keeping an eye on your comments, Stephen Beecham, tuning in from San Francisco. Welcome, guys. Howdy. And running the whole thing, we have the irreplaceable Brian Van Gelder joining us from New York, who is switching and keeping everything going smoothly via Zoom. All right, guys. Well, I'm super excited. I want to talk to you, Eric. Start off, I've been watching the weather all morning. How do you think it's looking for today? Are you thinking we're going to go ahead? Yeah, I think it's looking a lot better than it did on Wednesday. On Wednesday, as everyone's probably heard, it was scrubbed. Um, you know, it is tropical storm season around Florida right now. And there was a tropical storm moving in earlier in the week. And so there were con some concerns about thunderstorms and lightning. Uh, and at this point um, on Wednesday, there was a big red flag um, for launch in terms of the weather. And right now, those same signals are green. So we're looking a lot better. All right. Well, I'm very much keeping my fingers crossed. Um, Beach, you were watching on Wednesday with us. I, I know your son was watching. We're all super excited. And then it was, um, was cancelled. Have you got any feelings in your waters? I mean, I've gone for the scientific solution there with Eric. But I mean, we're all really wanting to get to see the launch today, aren't we? Yes, I think we have we have seventy percent chance. I heard last time that it's going to go. So we're I think they're looking good. It got up to seventeen minutes last time before launch. The, the astronauts were sitting in the capsule for about two hours, just waiting, and then it got scrubbed. So I think today we're going to have much better luck. Yeah, I was feeling I was feeling bad. I was like, gosh, we've set all our home studios up, we've gotten everything ready, and then suddenly <laughs> you're kind of like, well, those guys are actually strapped into a you know very expensive rocket. We haven't had a hard day like they have. Um, so we actually heard about why Wednesdays was uh, scrubbed, and it wasn't necessarily because of rain and those thunderclouds on the horizon. Um, we've got a clip here from the NASA administrator Jim Bridenstine, who was talking about the actual risks and why they made the call to scrub the launch. I know there's a lot of disappointment today. The weather got us. But I also want to say this was really, it was a great day for NASA. It was a great day for SpaceX. I think our teams worked together um, in a really impressive way, making good decisions all along. So here in this particular case, we had just simply too much electricity in the atmosphere. There wasn't really a lightning storm or anything like that, but there was a concern that if we did launch, um, it could actually trigger lightning. Um, and so we made the right decision. We had the parameters set ahead of time, the teams worked together, and in the end, the right decision was made. In just a few short days, on Saturday, Saturday afternoon, we're gonna do it again. Uh, here's what we know. We are gonna launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil. All right, that was Jim Bridenstine speaking on Wednesday shortly after the launch was cancelled. Now, Eric, you shared a, um, a document with me on Wednesday when we were sort of having these discussions, will it go, will it not go? There's a bunch of different factors that go into the launch, things like clouds, rain, lightning, and they're not just keeping an eye on Florida, they're keeping an eye all the way up the Atlantic coast, aren't they? Right, yeah, there's, there's several uh, launch weather criteria, as they're called, um, for launching the Falcon 9 and things that have to do with uh, lightning, with wind, with different clouds, with uh, thunder clouds. There's all these conditions that have to be met. And if they're not all green, then the launch doesn't happen. And uh, yeah, one of the things uh, that wasn't green on Wednesday was surface electrical fields. And that's what the administrator was talking about. Um, but as of right now, it looks like we're good. And yeah, there's also, as you mentioned, there's several basically abort points uh, through the Atlantic Ocean where something went wrong um, and the uh, astronauts had to, to ditch and basically uh, do a wet landing in the ocean. There's several points where they want to make sure weather is good in, in the Atlantic between here and the UK in case that has to happen, between Florida and the UK, I should say. 
All right. Fantastic. So, I mean, we've seen those kinds of abort tests before. I remember I was in Florida last year and saw uh, an abort test for NASA's Artemis mission. It's pretty impressive. They they fly the capsule up and at the last minute they, they fire off those rockets and make sure that everyone can get out safely. And of course, we're seeing that kind of safety in the lead up to the launch today. You know, we've got, um, we've got Doug and Bob sitting there strapped into the capsule. Now, Stephen, you've been watching all morning. We've seen a bunch of prep. How do you think, is it, is it deja vu? It's almost virtually shot for shot what we saw on Wednesday, wasn't it? Yeah, and it's, it's interesting. Like we saw the goodbye again this morning. Everything's happening in the same order. Everything is very carefully planned out in order in a sequence. So it is very much deja vu. But this time we got clear skies. I was seeing some moving clouds in the background, which made me, which made me nervous, but it's looking a lot better now. It looks like sunny skies there, so... Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. We saw we saw all the the family goodbyes this morning. We saw obviously it's it's quite a long day for these guys. Even before they get into the capsule, they have they have their steak and egg breakfast. Doug Hurley confirmed the other day that he actually had steak and egg steak and eggs for breakfast as the Apollo astronauts did. Um, then we had the families coming to say goodbye. It was a socially distant goodbye because obviously, you know, they've been prepping for this in the middle of quarantine, but it's also about making sure that there's, you know, nothing that happens wrong with their suits. Um, so what you can see there is the footage. Um, I love that shot of Bob Benkin doing a virtual hug with his family. Uh, he's got both of these astronauts are actually married to other astronauts, which is, um, yes. which is quite quite impressive so space um, family space family beautiful big happy space family so we we've, we've seen we've seen the kind of same steps eric talk me through after they leave in their tesla of course they're not using um no regular cars for these spacex astronauts talk me through what happens when they get to the launch pad and those kind of pre-stages as we count down towards the launch well there's a, a big thing and i forget if it happens before they get in the tesla or not um, but they do uh, visit the facilities to make sure before they're strapped in for two hours that the, the bladder has been vacated. So <laughs> that does take place. Uh, yeah, and then they're driven to the launch pad in that Tesla, and that's actually new, the Tesla. Uh, they used to be driven um, traditionally in an Astro van, which is a, a big modified Airstream trailer. So, But this being a SpaceX launch and the Tesla SpaceX family, it's different today. So they'll go up to the launch pad, up the elevator, uh, and through what's called the white room, which is, uh, you know, kind of the, the last the last room that they pass through and make sure that everything is OK. They're all checked out before actually climbing in to the Dragon capsule and getting uh, strapped in. And at that point, the capsule is sealed. And then there's a whole long series of checks and a very long checklist to make sure that everything is ready for launch. Fantastic. I mean, it's 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 kind of a repeated process, but these these astronauts are absolute pros. I heard them speaking on Wednesday saying that, you know, they've done shuttle launches. They they This isn't their first rodeo, so to speak. And so they know what they're doing and they've seen launches be scrubbed before. They're very practiced at staying calm, going through the motions, doing all the safety checks and being happy that right until T0, they could have to just abort the whole thing and get out again. But I guess importantly, that means that you can't skimp on safety. They have to treat today as though they're actually going to launch. They had to treat Wednesday, even with those rain clouds coming through, they had to treat it as though it was an actual launch because of course it was. And they're testing all of these systems because this is still a flight test. It's not an actual proper crewed launch. That's still yet to come, even though there are crew in the Dragon, in the Crew Dragon, this is still a test. So they're making sure that all these systems are working. Um, so if you're just joining us now, we are about 12 minutes away from the launch. You're here with CNET watching the SpaceX NASA Crew Dragon Demo 2 launch. You've got myself, Claire Riley. We've got space reporter Eric Mack and Stephen Beecham and Brian Van Gelder on the panel today. So if you want to follow along, feel free to jump into the YouTube comments. If you're on YouTube, tell us how you're feeling about this launch, whether you're excited. Is this your first launch that you've watched since the shuttle era? I've never actually been on American soil for a space launch. So this is very exciting for me today. Um, you can also follow along on Twitter if you're joining us, uh, hashtag CNET Live with any comments and thoughts you have about the day. So we've seen, we've seen a whole bunch of prep because this is a new era of commercial space travel. So traditionally in the shuttle era, these were NASA built shuttles, NASA built spacecraft, but now for the first time, it is a private company sending astronauts into space. 
Eric, talk to me, what's the significance of the commercial side of this program? Well, so, you know, um, commercial companies have always been involved with NASA, but typically the way it's worked in the past is uh, when NASA wants to build its next rocket, they'll just contract out to, to people to, to help build a rocket uh, or a spacecraft to their specifications. But what's different this time around with this commercial crew program of which SpaceX and Boeing are uh, the first companies participating is NASA says, okay, this is what we want to do. Um, and we'd like to basically um, be a customer of yours with whatever um, spacecraft you can design for us for this mission or whichever one you have in your stables that might work. So it's the difference between being a customer and hiring a contractor. And um, of course the Crew Dragon, this is gonna be the first um, commercial crew launch with humans aboard. Uh, there has been a commercial cargo program going for years, which is the predecessor to this. And so basically what we're seeing here is the version 2.0 of the SpaceX Dragon um, capsule. This is the second version that can carry both cargo and humans. In fact, up to seven people, it seats seven. So this is much bigger than what we've seen in the past. Absolutely. I think you're right. I mean, I was speaking to an astronaut or actually a private space tourist the other day. And when he flew on the Soyuz, he paid $30 million for a ticket, which is no mean feat. It's not a small amount of money there. Um, but when he flew in the Soyuz as a private tourist, he still had to get involved because there's only three seats on the Soyuz. So he had to control power systems. He was very much an active member of the crew. But with this Crew Dragon, seven seats, we're going to see a new era where we potentially have space tourists flying up on this crew dragon so not everyone who goes on the spaceship is necessarily going to have to have a job to do so that's kind of the the next era I suppose um Stephen would you I mean 30 million dollars maybe not do you see an Very era <laughs> do you see an era then when maybe your son might be a private space tourist do you think that's the kind of thing that could happen that you know it'll become that accessible I think I'm going to be a space tourist in like 20 years because I really want to go to space very bad. I'm saving up money for that right now. But yeah, they are going to make it more affordable for people. And I, I have a feeling like we are going to have some sort of shuttle to space in the next 20 to 30 years or something that is accessible to anybody. Um, the Space Force just in itself, like there's going to be a whole generation of people signing up to be a part of the Space Force. Um, so I think it could be I think it could be a, a pretty common thing in the future. Um, that said, I have, do you have a question from YouTube? Um, say, uh, someone's asking, if this is a big success today, is there another uh, space mission lined up that with SpaceX and NASA after this, like a follow-up mission after this one takes place? Uh, yes, there is. So this would be followed by, uh, in terms of, for the Crew Dragon, uh, there is, uh, a Crew-1 launch that's planned. It's currently planned, I believe, for later in the year for the fall in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and last I checked, I believe that will involve a couple of uh, NASA astronauts and an astronaut from JAXA, which is the Japanese uh, space uh, agency. So that should potentially be coming up later this year. Awesome. I mean, it's cool. It's so exciting to know that we're going to have a whole raft of these launches. As I say, I mean, I I haven't been to a space launch other than the abort test last year that I got to go down to Florida to see on literally humanity's hottest day. I almost <laughs> stepped on an alligator. It was a very terrifying experience. But, I mean, that's Florida, right? That's what you get. So it's, it's super exciting to know that we are going to be going into an era when we're actually going to see a, a far more regular cadence of crewed launches. We've got the SpaceX teams. We've got the Boeing teams, obviously both part of the commercial crew program. So it's very exciting that this is just the start. Um, all right, so how are we going on that countdown? We are now just... What was that, Stephen? I was just going to say, I just wanted to count Blue Origin in there too. Uh, of course. Jeff Bezos, like their capsule is meant for space tourism. Just going to launch you up in the space. You're going to get up there. You're going to float for a minute and then come back down. But uh, that's another competitor. And then uh, Virgin, Virgin, was it a Virgin Galactic. X? Is that what they're called? Virgin Galactic? Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of competition in this uh, in the space commercial 
Absolutely. And um, Bezos, uh, notoriously unwealthy man, probably <laughs> won't have the deep pockets to uh, finance this. No, he's definitely, he's definitely another player. We've got, we've got basically a bunch of ultra rich mega billionaires uh, taking us all into space. Richard Branson with Virgin Galactic, Elon Musk with SpaceX, uh, Bezos with, uh, with Blue Origin and their Blue Moon, that beautiful capsule. I'm very excited to see that launch. And, you know, he's, he's talking about getting entire colonies in space. So we We've got, we've got a very big future ahead of us. Um, immediately, though, we are about six minutes away now. Things are still looking good. Haven't had that abort call. So we've still got, as you can see there on your screen, we've got Doug Hurley in the foreground. He's running the show today um, with Bel Bob Benkin a little bit behind him. Both strapped in, ready to go. The propellant is loaded. Uh, what we're going to see is a, a launch of the rockets. We're gonna, we can take you through the whole breakdown. Um, I want to actually talk about the spacecraft itself. So I had a chat the other day to a, a, a former astronaut, Garrett Reisman. So he is a veteran of the shuttle era. He was telling me all about uh, what we're going to see today, but also how this is a very different style of space. Spacecraft. It's it's not just a privately built, but the actual makeup of the spacecraft itself is completely different and revolutionized. So, BBG, let's have a listen to that clip if we can. First and foremost, this Demo 2 mission is a big deal because it represents NASA and the United States of America being able to launch our own astronauts to the space station again, something we haven't been able to do for the past nine years since we flew the last space shuttle. But it's also much bigger than that because NASA doesn't actually own that Dragon spacecraft or that Falcon 9 rocket. SpaceX does, and SpaceX can use it for other missions once this NASA customer is satisfied. So this represents the beginning, really, of a new golden age of spaceflight where the general public will have the opportunity to go and fly in space. So Bob and Doug and myself, we all flew on the space shuttle. In fact, Bob and I made our first flight to space together on the space shuttle back in 2008. But the Dragon is very, very different than the shuttle, not only because of the obvious differences, the fact that it doesn't have wings, it's a capsule, but also because the things you do not see, which is that it's much more automated than the space shuttle was. The Dragon has the benefit of modern electronics, modern software, and it's smart. I mean, you gotta remember the computers in the space shuttle were designed in the 1970s. So a lot of the things that we spent a lot of time training to do in the crew of the space shuttle, the Dragon uh, can do all by itself. All right. Well, that was uh, Garrett Reisman, the former NASA astronaut, speaking to me earlier in the week. Um, we are going to go over to a full picture as we get closer to the countdown. We are three minutes 40 away. You're with CNET, myself, Claire Riley. We've got Eric Mack, Stephen Beecham and Brian Van Gelder on the panel with you today. I do want to briefly talk about this spaceship that they're in. This is a test flight but they don't really have many toggles or switches in front of them today. They are running in what is capable of a, being a completely autonomous spacecraft, but they will be doing a little bit of controlling of the spacecraft and they will be doing it with touchscreens, won't they, Eric? Yeah, I wrote about it this a little bit for, for CNET.com that, uh, you know, the difference is almost like uh, riding in a Tesla versus riding in a 1972 Ford Bronco, which I mean is a compliment to the Ford Bronco, which is a a venerable machine. But yeah, the, if you look at the inside the cockpit of the space shuttle, there's just buttons everywhere. Uh, and that's all been taken away. And uh, there's just touch screens. It's, it's uh, very sleek. It's a it's a beautiful interior and I was exactly the same. I just I had to be reminded of the Tesla and if you think of the shuttle, I was looking at old photos of the shuttle and it's just this big family camper van that's taken the American family to space in the mm -hmm. 80s and 90s. That's the vibe I got from it, but the SpaceX Crew Dragon is super sleek and beautiful. All right, I think what we might do is um Brian if we can get a, a larger shot of the rocket. We're seeing it on the launch pad. It's two minutes away. Um, you can you can flip us around if you like. I mean, people want to see my gorgeous face, I'm sure. But we are just two minutes away. I really feel like this is actually going to happen today. This is very exciting. Um, and uh, I mean, is that is that rain that I can see? I just got a shot of what looks like rain over one of the cameras out in the field. So. Um, 
look, we we can have rain and still go ahead. We've got other risk factors when it comes to this launch. I think what we might do now is see if we can listen in to the audio from NASA and see how they're going with those final checks. Um, a flurry of a flurry of fingers pressing screens um, and. And we can uh, we can just take a look. So obviously, Doug and Bob are going through the the, the final moments. Complete. We've got we're still green. We're still go for weather. That's the update, Eric. Yes. A lot of work done by thousands of people to get. All right, this looking point. good. Thousands of people. Oh yeah, I see that. What is that? They're spraying because I know that they were uh, cooling the engine, or they were uh, they were chilling the. Uh, chilling the rocket earlier. I wonder what that's coming Stage from. Two, lock is closed All right, let's go. Sorry. Let's go full screen now and watch the final countdown as NASA takes us through Dragon this Crew launch. Dragon Demo 2 launch of Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin to the International Stage Space two, Station. Stage load complete. All fuel, all oxidizer on Falcon 9. One minute, 34 seconds to go till launch. Ground gas closeouts is starting. Falcon 9 is in startup. Dragon is in countdown. FTS is armed for launch. Under a minute now, the FTS, the flight termination system, has been armed. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. SpaceX, Dragon, we're go for launch. Let's light this candle. T-minus 30 seconds. Stage one tanks pressing for flight. T-minus 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one, zero. Ignition. Lift off of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Go NASA. Go SpaceX. Godspeed. Bob and Doug. America has launched. One alpha. And so rises a new era of American space flight. And with it, the ambitions of a new generation continuing the dream. 20 seconds into flight, stage one propulsion is nominal. plus 30 seconds into this historic mission. Flying crew on board Dragon and Falcon 9 and look at them go. Falcon power telemetry nominal. M1D throttle down. We're throttling down to get ready for the period of maximum dynamic pressure. We're in the throttle bucket. Reports say all systems are go. Vehicle is supersonic. We've exceeded Mach 1 on the Falcon 9. M1D throttle up. We're throttling back up to full power as we're through Max Q. Copy, 1 Bravo. And we heard that 1 Bravo call out. That's just the second aboard zone that they're in. They'll continue to be on this until the first stage has done its job and they switch over to the second. At this point, Bob and Doug pulling about 2.3 Gs, 2.3 times the Earth's gravity, already moving at over 1,500 miles per hour. We've heard the call out for MVAC engine chill. That's getting the MVAC engine ready to light. That'll come at about 2.44 into flight. Right now, everything continuing to look good. Next major event coming up is gonna be the triple We'll have main engine cutoff of the nine first stage engines, stage separation, and then ignition of the second stage engine to continue to carry astronauts into orbit. Coming up in about 20 seconds. M M1D throttle down.
We heard we're throttling down the Merlin engines on the first stage. And we have Miko. Miko. Two Alpha. Falcon stage separation confirmed. Copy two Alpha. And back ignition. All right, we have stage separation confirmed. The first stage beginning its flight back. The second stage being powered by that single Merlin 1D vacuum engine has ignited and is now carrying Bob and Doug into orbit. So they're going to continue under the power of this second stage. Stage two propulsion is nominal. Which will cut off at SECO, or second engine cut off, at about 8 minutes and 44 seconds into today's flight. So a little over 5 minutes to go still on this second stage. You heard the call out to Alpha, so they're now in the longest abort zone that carries them all the way from about North Carolina up the eastern seaboard almost to Canada. Things looking good though, getting good call outs, nominal propul pul propulsion on that second stage. Bob and Doug continuing to make their way into orbit. Dragon SpaceX nominal trajectory. Acquisition of signal in Bermuda. SpaceX Dragon nominal trajectory. All right, here in nominal trajectories, the Dragon pointed in the right direction, continuing to make their flight uphill. Heard acquisition of signal Bermuda. That's one of the other ground stations that they're using to get telemetry and data back from this spacecraft. Stage two propulsion is still nominal. little over four minutes, 40 seconds into the flight. Bob and Doug flying at more than 5,600 miles Dragon per SpaceX hour. Dragon SpaceX nominal trajectory. Already almost 200 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center. Nominal trajectory continuing. While they continue uphill, looks like we are getting a view of the first stage as well. Yep, on your right screen, you can see that first stage with the grid fins deployed. It's making its way back to attempt to land on our drone ship. Of course, I still love you today. And we're just about a minute, uh, a couple minutes away from the entry burn, and that's where three of the nine Merlin engines do ignite to help slow the vehicle down as it re enters back into the Earth's atmosphere. And then after the entry burn will be the landing burn, which is just a single engine Dragon burn. SpaceX nominal trajectory. And you heard nominal starting chill for entry burn. There's that call out. They are still on a nominal trajectory on Dragon, still on second stage, and that's that MVAC engine on second stage on your left screen. Again, on your right screen is that first stage booster coming back towards our drone ship. Of course, I still love you. We're about a minute away from entry burn. Meanwhile, that second stage continuing to power Dragon into orbit. Again, if you're keeping an eye on that timer, that's going to continue to burn until 8 minutes and 44 seconds into flight. So a little over two minutes from now, we'll hear the call out SECO. It'll then be a little stage under, two propulsion a little is still over. Good a little over three minutes until Dragon physically separates from the second stage of the Falcon 9 after the upper Dragon stage SpaceX gets a chance. Dragon nominal trajectory. Dragon copies, nominal trajectory. Continuing to check in with Bob and Doug as they are on a nominal trajectory. Just about 10 seconds away from that first stage, starting that entry burn on your right screen. We should be able to see that view live. Stage one entry burn startup.
And there is that entry burn the beginning. Burn. This burn lasts about 36 seconds long. Stage two FTS is saved. That entry burn continues. We're just about a minute away from Seco. We'll have a number of events all happen in rapid succession. Uh, it'll Talking be the shutdown. second engine cutoff. Stage one we'll be looking for down. that uh, stage one landing burn shortly after. Yeah, actually, just within a few seconds of each other. It's such a cool view on your left screen, seeing Bob and Doug on Dragon. Right now, you can see the displays that they are seeing right now themselves. Terminal guidance. I'm back there, all up. We are coming up 25 seconds or so away from Seco, or second engine cutoff. This is also the point where Bob and Doug are experiencing their highest G-force. We're seeing the counter tick up to right about 4.8. Copy, Shannon. You heard Shannon, so that just means they're in their final abort zones. If they were to abort at this point, would either be in abort to orbit or to land off the coast of Ireland. Standing by for second one line cutoff started. confirmation. And back throttle step. And back shut down. Stage one landing winner. Confirmation of Seco second engine cutoff. Now we are waiting for our first stage to make its way to our drone ship. Of course, I still love Dragon, you. Dragon SpaceX nominal orbital insertion. Just confirmation is nominal orbital Dragon insertion. Captain, nominal stage orbital one, insertion. And what you're seeing on your screen is a live view of our drone ship, where our first stage will be coming down. Looks like we lost that live view, but we'll wait for confirmation of that landing shortly here. Falcon 9 first stage is successfully landed. And the there you can see on your screen, Falcon 9 has landed. This is the first Falcon 9 to carry okay, humans to orbit, so very exciting for us. And as you can see on your right screen, Bob and Doug are still making their way to their targeted orbit. Have one to recovery one. So exciting today. <laughs> It doesn't stop. It does not stop. All right, we did we did hear again that call out good orbital insertion, so that means Falcon 9 and Dragon right now exactly where they're supposed to be. Can we need to FRC on recovery one? And it's right at about 12 minutes when Can Dragon will separate. Looks like we saw a zero G indicator floating around there. I know Bob and Doug owe us a little bit about what exactly that is that they brought up with them. <laughs> And before separation, before Dragon initiates separation from the second stage, they do make sure to make, they, they do ensure that the vehicle is not spinning and it is in good con condition before we separate. That's right. The upper stage does small attitude maneuver using some cold gas thrusters built into the rocket body itself. All right, if you are just so joining us, we have just seen the successful launch now, of the Crew Dragon demo to Hapshul. It it's is very exciting. The mission has gone off, and after the delays on Wednesday, we've seen it finally launch. We also Such saw cool at the views. end of that shot there, you saw the Falcon 9 right reusable rocket land back on the drone ship. So that happened successfully. It looked like it's all gone ahead pretty well here. Um, we've got a shot of the control room on the left there, and on on the right, you can see on the left of screen, Doug Hurley, and on the right of screen, Bob Benken, both snug inside their capsule, uh, making their way into orbit. Now, this part, of the, the, this part of the actual mission is only really about 12 minutes for them to get into space, but then it's a number of hours before they can actually get into the orbit with the ISS, and then tomorrow they will be docking. In the morning, Eastern time, they'll be docking with the ISS. So, so wonderful to see it all go off without a hitch there. Let's Let's, let's go back and we'll take a look at the uh, we'll take a look at the full screen there. It sounds like we had an expected I think they're about OS to separate. Signal with one of the ground stations. 
All right, so what's happening there is the crew dragon actually separates. And there you can see it, the crew dragon separating from the second stage. So we had the, uh, the Falcon 9 rocket, the second stage separates, the Falcon comes down back to Earth and lands on the drone ship, the second stage and the crew dragon continue on into space. And what we've just seen in that beautiful, very sci-fi looking shot there, we've got the crew dragon heading out on its own and making its way slowly on the appearance of things actually traveling at about uh you know 17 and a half thousand miles all things considered 17 and a half thousand miles per hour but it will slowly make its way into the orbit of the iss so that it can dock safely um now they're obviously using some of those controls on the touch screen in front of them um eric what was that like is this uh how does this rate in your uh in your space launches that you've watched uh i mean this is this is this is pretty near the top. I mean, just look at that that live shot from within the cockpit where, I, number one, I mean, that is perhaps the biggest first for me is to actually watch these guys as they're flying up through the atmosphere and into space. I don't think we've ever seen that live. Um, and, and that's just huge. This is kind of this is kind of the space future that we were always promised. You know, this actually looks like what space looks, should look like for sci fi geeks. Right. Yeah, Absolutely. that shot behind them, that shot behind the two astronauts looking up at the screens, that is incredible. That is an incredible shot, and that's, like, inspiring to many people, I'm sure. I love that shot. It's beautiful. I mean, with the Apollo launches in 1969, we only ever, we got all the transcripts, we got all the audio, and you can listen to them on the NASA website, which is lots of fun if you're a mad space geek and you want to dig through all those old, old audio logs. But to actually be able to see it in real time, to see two people flying into space after a successful launch. The docking is going to be visible tomorrow as well, so we'll be able to actually see them come into dock with the ISS, which is super exciting. We'll be carrying that on CNET's Highlights channel, so make sure to tune in for that. But I think that's what's so marvellous about this is that it feels like it's really democratised space travel. Everyone can watch this around the world, see it happening in real time in this completely cutting-edge spacecraft. I mean... This is a completely new era. It feels to me like I'm seeing the start of something really wonderful here. And I actually love that this is happening now during what are some pretty pretty dark times around the world. Because I mean, what we've what we've just seen and what is still going on is this is an exercise in extreme competence that has taken years of planning and engineering, um, and hundreds, thousands of people have had their fingerprints on this project. And so to be able to pull it off, and you know, you mentioned something before the launch, Claire, that uh, you know they were doing all this in quarantine. What's interesting is that NASA has such stringent standards for quarantine uh, before any launch. The protocols are so strict that they didn't really have to change much for for COVID nineteen. So it's really cool to see that. Um, with so much uncertainty in the world and all of us just kind of muddling through the, these very uncertain times to be able to pull something up like this off is is inspiring and reminds us of what we're capable of I think. you're absolutely right yeah. and i i was I'll, I'll jump to you steven yeah i was just gonna uh say the chat room is asking when is the docking gonna happen so they're on their way to the space station now. When is it going to occur? Do you get, any of you guys know? Yep, we've got that here. So we've got just as a timeline for the rest of um, today and the rest of their kind of uh, day one of this space travel. We've got, we had the 322 liftoff. Now it was an instantaneous launch window. So they had to make that 322 p.m. Eastern time launch window successfully. They did that. Um, we had the phase burn and then at... 4.55, we've got the Farfield manual flight test. Um, so this is a fully autonomous vehicle. Uh, it's capable of being completely controlled autonomously, but because it's a demo test flight, we are going to see Bob and Doug actually taking manual control of the of the spacecraft, which is going to be really exciting to see. Um, at 6.30 uh, this evening, we have a post-launch news conference news conference from Kennedy. So that's 6.30 Eastern. And then tomorrow, we've got a whole series of events happening at 10.29 
Eastern time. Um, let me just double check whether that's Eastern or we have been having a delightful time being based on the West Coast uh, with this uh, conversions. I'm definitely not used to, I'm still thinking in Australian time, half of me. Uh, 10.29, we've got the docking. And at 12.45 p.m., we have the hatch opening. So they'll actually dock with the ISS. They'll come in close. Um, that last part of the kind of the journey and the latch on to the ISS is actually going to be done autonomously, but they will be getting a handle for the touchscreen controls as they get close to the ISS. Um, they're going to dock. And then at about, what's that? Two and a bit hours later at 12.45 PM, they have the hatch opening. So very weird that they're just going to be sitting there kind of maybe knocking on the door. I have a, a nice image of that. Um, and then they'll actually have a kind of a full meet and greet with the one US astronaut that is currently on the ISS uh, who flew up there via Soyuz. Um, and then at 1.05 p.m. we have a welcome ceremony. I'm assuming just uh, some cheeky shared plates, nibbles. Um, don't really know what they got planned for that, but hopefully it's a big fun party. Mm -hmm. So um, all of those times I gave you were... Um, okay, cool. So those were all Eastern yeah. time. Yeah, they were Eastern time. Yeah, they're going to be greeted by Christopher Cassidy, who is the uh, current uh, uh, American astronaut on the space station. He was with the Expedition 63 mission, which launched in April on a April 17th of this year. And he's going to be up there till October. And he's up there with, they're up there with two uh, Russian astronauts or cosmonauts on board the ISS, Anatoly Ivanishin and Ivan Wagner are also on the space station right now. So that's who's up there. We're going to be hanging out with, uh, with Robert and Doug. Fantastic. So we, we actually saw um, in a bit of the pre-coverage, we saw uh, Chris with a, uh, an American flag that was taken up at the end of the shuttle program. They took up a little American flag. It stayed on the ISS since then. And when Doug and her, Bob uh, leave the ISS, they'll actually be taking that flag home with them, which I think is a really nice kind of full circle, closed loop. So um, Eric, can you talk us through, I mean, why are they just hanging around? Uh, it only takes them about 10 to 12 minutes to get into space. Um, talk us through kind of what happens next. What do you think they're going to be doing over the, the coming hours before that, um, that docking tomorrow morning? Well, I think it's a lot of just getting lined up, um, getting to the, the correct elevation and then get, getting into basically the path of the ISS so that they can rendezvous. And uh, again, this is all happening at 17,000 miles per hour. So, you know, there's a lot of precision involved, just making sure that uh, you're doing those orbits while, while getting lined up. Um, and then you know, then the mission is only really just beginning though. Like you, like you said, they'll be on the space station for a while uh, for an undetermined amount of time, uh, as I last heard. And then at some point within the next couple of months, uh, they'll get back into crew dragon and come back to earth for the first time in that vehicle, splash down in the ocean. And then there's actually a, a pretty cool procedure where uh, SpaceX has a custom ship that goes out, plucks them out and then uh, puts them on the ship. And there's a, a, a helicopter landing pad on the ship to get them back to land. So, I mean, it's really just beginning and it's going to keep going for weeks. Fantastic. All right. Well, we've got NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine there in the picture in picture. Let's go to his audio and hear him do a bit of a breakdown of what we just saw. I tell you, I am not going to celebrate until Bob and Doug are home safely. Um, tomorrow, they're going to dock to the International Space Station. Tonight, I'm heading to Houston to be at the, the Johnson Space Center uh, when that happens. So, um, it is, it is a, it's a bit of a relief. The, the nose cone is now open. Um, it's now deployed, uh, which means that, um, you know, now we're going to go into some, some burns. We're going to have some phasing burns. We're going to have some, um, some, you know, boosting burns, and we're going to get uh, as much as we can in alignment with the International Space Station um, as early as possible here. But also, um, I know it's hard, but, you know, the big thing that we need to do now is <laughs> we've got to get... Bob and Doug, who have now gone through this exercise twice, they need to get some rest. Um, but I, I can guarantee you there will be no rest for a good, a good amount of time while they're up there in orbit. And they are certainly on their way. And a lot of people joining us for this entire celebration and watching it. We just heard uh, 10 million people watching live as this launch happened. And President Donald Trump becoming the third sitting president to watch a launch live from the Kennedy Space Center. The first well, to be clear, the, I think he's the only sitting president to watch American astronauts launch on a brand new rocket that has never launched before. 
Uh, and uh, that's a big risk. You know, he also said we're going to go to the moon by 2024. That means he's, <laughs> he's putting himself at risk to say, look, I'm going to be accountable, potentially, I'm going to be accountable to the, the initiatives that I put forward. And I think that's, we have not had that kind of leadership for space in a very, very long time. And, uh, and we're, we're so grateful for it. What was it like watching the launch with the president? How did he react? Oh, I, I'll tell you, um, it's obviously something that um, is near and dear to him. He said it. A year and a half ago, he put it in the State of the Union speech. He said, we're going to launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil. And of course, I was like, in my, in my head, I'm thinking, we better get, we better get after this. Um, and uh, of course, we've had, we, we've worked overtime to, to, to make it happen. Um, we might be a little behind schedule, <laughs> but we got it done. And we got it done safely. We're knocking on wood, um, but, um, but so far so good. It's looking good. You personally, Jim, as that rocket was lifting off and you felt that rumble, Yeah. Uh, what'd you feel? What'd you experience? Well, I was praying. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. I was praying. I was praying for Bob and Doug. I was praying for their families. I was praying for their safe return, even though they're just going. Um, but man, I'll tell you, it was, uh, I've heard that rumble before, but it's a whole different feeling when you've got your own team on that rocket, and uh, and they are our team. They are America's team. This is Launch America. This is everything that America has to offer in its purest form. And times are tough right now. There there is no doubt. Um, we've got the coronavirus pandemic. We have other challenges as a country. But I hope this moment in time is an opportunity for everybody to reflect on humanity and what we can do when we work together, when we when we strive, and when we achieve. And if this can inspire a young child to become the next Elon Musk or the next Jeff Bezos or the next Sir Richard Branson, uh, then that's what this is all about. Or the next Jim Bridenstine. Yeah. All right. Well, that was Jim Bridenstine, NASA Administrator, talking about his feelings post-launch um, and inspiring the next generation, which I think is a, a really wonderful message because this is obviously not just about what we've seen today it's um it's a crude launch it's not just a manned launch the next people getting into the spacex crew dragon we will see a female astronaut in there that's really wonderful to see and obviously coming up after this we've got the whole era of commercial space travel boeing is going to have its commercial crew prag program launch um we've got a whole bunch of other stuff happening in private space discovery at the moment and then as jim bridenstine mentioned there 2024 we have the artemis mission taking the next man and the first woman back to the moon um we're going to wrap up here shortly i just i want to get some closing thoughts from you guys uh stephen what do you think about today how are you feeling after just seeing a, a fantastically successful space launch I'm extremely happy, extremely proud for America, extremely proud for the astronauts. Um, my kids are in the other room watching. They're jumping around saying, Daddy, it's coming down. It's going to land. So it's a big moment for a lot of people today, and it's awesome. That's so wonderful. I saw your son briefly run into shot when we were listening to uh, Bridenstine there, just uh, waving his hands around. It was uh, really exciting to see. Um, now, Eric, how are you feeling? You've obviously covered space for some time for us for CNET and you are across everything that's happening. You're across every, you know, uh, touchdown with asteroids in the far reaches of our solar system and you're across these big events like this, these crude launches. Um, how big is this for you in terms of our, our space travel picture right now? Uh, you know, the first like news event that I remember is uh, in first grade watching live the Challenger disaster. And uh, then the first, one of the first stories I covered as a reporter was the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster. And I felt like there was a, I got a little closure to that at the end of the Space Shuttle program in 2011. And there was the, the cool moment of uh, one of the Space Shuttles being paraded through the streets of Los Angeles on its way to a museum. And there was some closure with that, but this, this feels like a catharsis, you know, uh, totally moving on to a new era. and. Uh, it was, it was impressive. It was worth the wait. It's so wonderful. It's nice to hear that you've actually got some um, some good news to report on. Um, I, I, I certainly know that I have kind of seen the space discovery journey happen from afar. I've been to our Deep Space Communications Network in Australia. I saw the little printout of um, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin's EKGs, their heart rates as they first went out and landed on the moon. And you can see a, a, another comparison, Michael Collins, which is staying real steady and slow. And then you got uh, Neil Armstrong 
Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin just completely flipping out, landing on the moon. Um, this feels like the next stage for us, and it's really exciting to see. Not an American, but certainly celebrating with you guys. And I think this is definitely an achievement for all of humanity when we need a bit of good news right now to see that we are going back into space and we're going to be doing some amazing science and having some wonderful discoveries while we're there and it's really democratizing that space travel and bringing it back to all of us so that's so good to see um the journey is not over by any means you can continue to watch on cnet highlights that's our cnet youtube channel that's going to continue this live coverage um going on throughout this afternoon and then of course obviously we have got the docking tomorrow morning so i'll give you those times again that's a 10 20 a.m 20 10.29 a.m. Eastern Time, docking with the Crew Dragon, meeting the International Space Station. And then the thing that you really want to see is those doors opening. So at 12.45 p.m. Eastern, the hatch on the Crew Dragon is going to open and Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin will enter the International Space Station, greet the astronaut and cosmonauts inside and start their stay on the ISS. So thank you so much for joining us. You can catch all of that tomorrow on CNET Highlights. We will have it for you. It's been so wonderful to have you guys watching this today, really celebrating this. So we're all stuck at home in our lounge rooms and watching this from afar. It's really wonderful to have some good news. Um, Eric, Stephen, BBG, thank you so much for joining me on the panel, um, being here for my first American rocket launch. So exciting. And to all of you at home, I hope you've enjoyed this coverage. You can keep tweeting at us, hashtag CNET Live on our social channels. Uh, stay tuned. We're going to have so much more space coverage for you. We are just getting started. All right. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Bye -bye.